Hey, beloved saints. Um, I've been getting this question a lot. Uh, while I'm working on other videos, I wanted to answer this. Um, I got it again this morning, and someone said, please, please answer this as soon as you can. Uh, I think brother David Benjamin has a view on the book of James, and I think it agrees with brother Luke, because uh, brother Luke, who I do the Church of the Eternally Secure with, and uh, have worked uh, with him on CES now over five years, I think it's six maybe, um, he holds to this position. I do not. Uh, I can explain why I disagree, but I also have no problem with people disagreeing with me on this. As long as they're not saying salvation is by works, I, I mean, I have no issue with it. So um, people, there's there's two positions that I see on James other than work salvation. I'm talking about uh, to support the real gospel. And their position, and I don't want to speak for David because I don't know for certain, uh, but I get the gist, I think, of what he's saying based on what this gentleman uh, asked is that he believes this happened prior to the Acts uh, event where they were confused on, well, what about this? When Gentiles get converted, do they have to keep the Jewish customs? I mean, do we lay these burdens on them? Do they become Jews? How do we do this, right? So it came, uh, they all agreed and uh, said, look, we're not going to lay any burdens on anyone. Uh, they're justified by faith in Christ, uh, but we would ask uh, and the Holy Spirit agreed uh, that they stay away from fornication, meat offered uh, idols, and blood and strangled, I think is what they said. And uh, fornication, you should do well. You know, send them on their way. That that should that should be good. Now, that was not even just salvation because they were disciples. So they had to keep, maintain something that was, um, you know, a view of others. Other people were going to see them. So they couldn't have the the reputation of being fornicators. And, and at this time they weren't sure about the food law. So they just said, well, let's just stay away from blood and things strangled. So, um, later on you even see where Paul says, and what's an idol? It's nothing. But if your conscience condemns you, don't eat it. Right. Cause whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So you see evolution of understanding like progressive revelation in the scripture. So I think their position is this was written by James prior to that event in Acts that clarified that we're justified by faith in Christ, what Jesus did alone. Now, this is just for salvation. Once we're saved, we should do X, Y, and Z. All Christians agree on what we should be doing, okay? Okay. The difference is we don't say should and must are the same thing because we don't want people trusting anything they're doing, but we want people to trust wholly in what Jesus did and, and rely on his imputed righteousness by faith instead of their own righteousness from their works, their behavior. So I think uh, Brother Luke believes that. I don't know if he believes the same thing about the acts, but I know he does think that this was during a time before there was clarity on justification. So I disagree with that. I think James doesn't say anything that is uh, refuting faith alone for salvation. Um, when Peter was drowning, he said, Lord, save me. Did he mean from hell? No, he was drowning. Save me. You can be saved from something other than eternal damnation. And I believe that is the judgment James is referring to, as well as uh, referring to being saved from earthly lack and, and, and needs being met. Uh, if there's an earthly need of food and clothing, you can't just go, oh, oh, I'll pray for you, go in peace, and not provide the thing the person needs. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're naked, clothe them. Um, because faith can't save them from that. But I think that uh, the faith saving is, is talking about the judgment um, because there is a temporal, earthly judgment. There, there's earthly consequence, as well as uh, some people call it the Bema seat. 
uh, reward, chastisement, whatever. Some people don't believe in eternal reward. Some people believe it's earthly or it's temporal chastisement, whatever you believe, but it's not has nothing to do with eternal salvation. Now, uh, I'll show you reasons why. The Bible has to be taken as a whole. And that means we, we don't just take one section on its own. It has to be compared to other scriptures. And we have to look at what a scripture is not saying as much as what it is, right? Because we can jump to a lot of conclusions based on the view we have in our own mind, our own theological views. So when I read it, I was like, yeah, well, I can see how someone could think that it's saying opposite of Paul, but I, I don't think so because I, I really didn't see a problem with it because I didn't see the context being eternal salvation because I see these people already saved. Just like if Paul is teaching the church, hey, don't do what the unsaved do. Don't act like the unrighteous. They're not going to inherit the kingdom. So why are you doing things you know God brings judgment on, right? So uh, I, I think it's the same thing. He's instructing Jewish believers on how to perfect their faith. And I think it's actually um, helping motivate them because it's not uh, eternal salvation at stake, but that's not the only thing there is. Being born is not all there is to it. Once you're born, you should grow up. You get born, do you stop growing? No, you grow up into maturity and perfection or perfect means mature uh, in the scripture. So with that being said, let, let's look at James. I do not hold the position David Benjamin and Brother Luke have. I, I do not have a problem with it. I mean, uh, I don't agree with it, but that's not a big deal to me. As long as somebody's not preaching work salvation by it, I, I, I don't have an issue with it. I could see where they, they'd get that. It's possible. Um, so let's look at James. All right. So first thing I'm going to do is go over to James chapter one. Let's look at the intro here. James is the half brother of Jesus, brother Lord. And it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scat scattered abroad, greeting. So these are believers. The Hebrew believers, okay? So, my brethren, already saved. Already saved, okay? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So, when, when your patience is uh, uh, tried uh, and your, your faith is tested, it builds strength in your faith, okay? But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Ah, so we're talking about mature faith. Are we seeing that here? Right away, it gives us the context. Uh, you're trying of your faith, work with patience. Let patience have her perfect work. So the purpose of allowing temptation is not so that you fall into it and get trapped or be destroyed. The purpose of it is to build your faith, okay? So, let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, okay? So, it's advantageous to these believers, these saved people, to grow up and mature in their faith, right? Because it comes with many spiritual benefits. So, it says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a man of the sea, wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So he's saying, you either believe the Lord for something or you don't. Okay. And you can ask in faith with confidence because it's God's will that he give you uh, wisdom. He wants you as his children to get more and more revelation of his ways. So you can ask knowing he's going to answer that. All right. So let the brother of low degree rejoice that he is exalted. But let the rich and that he's made low because the as the flower of the grass, 
he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it wear with the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. So that's not saying that all wealthy people aren't saved. It's just saying don't trust in your riches. These things are temporary. Okay, if we want to put that in a simple way. Um, blessed is a man that endures temptation. Again, maturity, profiting the church, profiting individuals in their faith and in their growth. Maturity is perfection. Perfect and mature are both uh, synonyms in the scripture for spiritual maturity. Um, so it says, and never, never say I am tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin when it's finished, bringeth forth death. And I've said before many times, sin brings death to saved and unsaved alike. Why would we do something that brings destruction or even death to finances, death to the family, uh, death to your witness and testimony, all kinds of ways it can destroy us. Again, James is encouraging people, saved people, Hebrew believers in growing into maturity, not giving into temptation, but allowing the temptation to strengthen their faith. Okay. And so that they mature. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, that's a funny word, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Okay, so look at this. Don't just uh, 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 read God's word, hear what God says. Hey, love your neighbor as yourself. Ju don't judge hypocritically. Show mercy. And with that same mercy, you'll be given mercy. Now, this is temporal, okay? Temporal. This benefits us in an earthly fashion. So, um, now... And it says, for he beholdeth himself and goeth this way and straightway forgetteth the manner of man he was. You see, he's, he's like a, a, a man that hears the word and, and isn't doing it. He sees himself temporarily, right? He sees his natural state in the, in the mirror. But when he walks away, he forgets it. All right. The law is a mirror to show us our need for a savior, first of all. So God's word should stir us to putting into action. Okay. We are people saved unto good works. We're not saved by them in any fashion. I don't care how they twist it. Um, you know, I, I love what a, a pastor said recently. And I think about um, the thief on the cross. You know, imagine I heard a pastor say this recently. He said it was, imagine he's, 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 in, he's at the gate of heaven and the angels are like, what are you doing here? You know? And, and there's a ruckus, you know, how did he get in here? What's he doing here? You know, this thief, he was a, he's an executed criminal. The guy on the cross next to me said I could come. All he said was, Lord, I acknowledged who he was. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Secondly, acknowledge he's the promised king of the scriptures. That's all he did. So in acknowledging that he's Lord and he's king, all that came with those promises in the scriptures, and a Jew would have understood in first century, he had the power to allow him interest into the kingdom. And he trusted him. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Because he's able to deliver what he promises. Okay? And that's all we believe. None of us is getting there on our merit. Did you guys hear that? Because I got a little quiet there. He acknowledged him as Lord and King. Meaning he understood that he was 
able and had the authority and the power to allow him entrance into that kingdom. And that's what we do. We trust that our Lord promised that to us and we believe him. Okay. It's as simple as that. Now, man is what tries to take that and make it complicated because for one, it doesn't seem right to man. It's not fair. You're telling me you can just do this and do that. They don't like grace. Okay. Because there's always somebody more wicked than them that they don't think it's fair to get in. They could see how, <laughs> how wicked they actually are compared to God. They'd just be grateful that God saved them. But sadly, most people have not been broken by God's standard of the law. And so they don't like that grace is freely given. And, um, you know, you notice the thief on the cross didn't say, Lord, I, I was pretty good. Uh, you know, I was a thief and all, but I, I, I lived a pretty good life. I prayed. I went to synagogue. He didn't. He just said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He knew who he was. That's all. That's it. He had to, he acknowledged that this man, Jesus Christ, was Lord and King. He was divine. He was the promised one and had the authority to allow him entrance. That's all he knew. So if asked, the man on the cross next to me said I could come. That's why I'm going. Because the man on that cross said I could come in. And I, I hope, I hope that's what you all believe. Okay. so. Uh, if he's, if he's not doing it, <laughs> it, it, he walks away from it. He's not, um, the, the word is not in his heart. It's not working to remind him of who he is in Christ. Right. And the law is supposed to stir us up to trusting in Christ because we realize our, our need for him. And the uh, love, uh, the memory and, and the knowledge of the grace of God and the goodness of God should stir us up to give the same grace and mercy and love to others, right? So if we don't do that, we're walking away and forgetting who we are in Christ as well as our own fallen state, okay? So it's just not allowed, they're not allowing the word to work in them in their life. It has nothing to do with whether um, they're saved or not. Okay. Now here it says, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, of freedom. Okay. This is one of the reasons I believe James knows very well how a man is justified in the sight of God. And, I, and I'll show you because it's not just James. That's the Bible. There's Paul, there's Jesus, there's a lot of people the Holy Spirit inspired to write in here. And we have to compare the verses and know when it's talking to, to who it's talking and all of that. Okay, so um, look into the perfect law of liberty. So we're not under bondage of the law. So I, I don't I think he was aware of that and continue it therein. Okay, what's that? Trusting in Christ. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be what? Saved? Oh, no. Blessed in his deed. Okay. So this is a temporal blessing. All right. It's being blessed. See how it benefits us. We're saved on two good works. It's a wise man. That, that does these things. All right. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You want to be a good religious man? Do that. Do that. It's real simple. That, he didn't say that saves you. Okay. We've got to look at what it's saying, what it's not saying. Now, it's talked about maturity. It's talked about uh, growing up is talked about being blessed in the work and in the deed, but it also talked about the law of liberty. All right. Now it says, my brethren, again, confirming they're saved, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the Lord of glory with respect of persons. Meaning don't set the rich man in the front and treat the poor man badly. Okay. For if they're coming to your assembly, a man with a gold ring, goodly apparel, and they're coming also a poor man in vile raiment, and you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, that doesn't mean what it means today, it means happy or colorful, and say unto him, sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, stand thou over there, or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? So you, you're not supposed to uh, judge by the outer appearance or how much money somebody has or how you can benefit by buddying up to them. We are all one in Christ. Okay, so that's it's considered sin. Hearken, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? But you have despised the poor? Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Okay, so this is just him. Hey, he's telling them straight up. You guys are being a bunch of hypocrites doing that. Do not they blaspheme, blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. Okay. Uh. Did he say, if you do that, you are saved? No. You do well. Just like you're blessed in the deed earlier. Okay? But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced the law as transgressors. Now, this is law of liberty. Law of liberty. Love your neighbors as yourselves. That means the poor also. You're transgressing that. Okay, so I, I don't think he's talking mosaic here. And, but this he is, whoever shall keep the whole law and offend in one point, he's guilty of all. We already know you can't be justified by the law. But I'm going to take this further and I'm going to show you. We're going to compare this and go to Romans and in Genesis and see uh, why we need to look elsewhere, not just James, and to get the full story. That, that's the thing. The Bible works as a whole and the, it crisscrosses between Old Testament, and New Testament. It points back and forth, back and forth. It's amazing. 66 books, 44 writers, uh, Holy Spirit inspired all of them over 1500 years and they work together. Hundreds of prophecies, things called in the future before they ever happen. It's amazing. All right. For he that, uh, for he that said, do not commit adultery said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So that is Mosaic. Okay. Now, remember, he's speaking to Hebrew. Uh, he's speaking to Israelites that are believers in Christ. And he does talk about the law of liberty. I, I do not believe that James thinks they're still under the bondage. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Says it again. Okay? You're going to be judged by the law of liberty. Now, Paul says, everyone's going to be judged by my gospel. What, what is that? That Christ died for his sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he rose again the third day. That's what the world's going to be judged on. Not the gospel, the false ones were given. That you got to be circumcised, keep the law of Moses, but the law of liberty, that Jesus did it. You're not under that bondage. It brings death. Okay, you can if you wish, but don't think it's saving you. It's not. Now, it says, for if he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Judge by the law of liberty. Okay, this is temporal. Now, some people believe it does refer to the judgment seat of Christ for saved people. Because Jesus says that you'll be rewarded here in this earth and in the kingdom to come. Okay, so I do believe that, but some don't. So I'm leaving it there for those that don't so that they can
see that either way, it's still not talking about eternal salvation of the soul. They're already saved. Okay. And they're not uh, being saved by keeping the law here. But you still don't want to do anything. <laughs> As a saved person, you don't want to do anything that God says is not good. Uh, because why? Because you're blessed in the deed. All right. And it, it profits you. And uh, you're going to have the same uh, judgment with mercy that you show another. Okay. That is not talking about your eternal. That is already redeemed. All right. Now it says, what does, what does a prophet, my brethren, do a man say he has faith and have not worth? Can faith save him if a brother or sister be naked? But there's no periods and stuff in the Bible. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. And one of you say, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Profit. What does it gain? How is it producing anything? How is it serving God? How is it helping anyone? How is it profiting anyone? If you see someone naked, has no food, yet you have the ability to feed them and clothe them and don't. How is your faith helping anyone? You can go around and tell the world I'm a person of faith and never do anything of faith and go right to heaven because we're saved by God's grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But, oh man, why would you? Why would you not do what the Lord tells us is our purpose here on earth? We're saved unto good works. It's our very purpose. And how would my faith profit anyone if I wasn't out here preaching the good news of the gospel? I'm a woman of faith, but I don't help anybody. I don't help my friend when she loses her housing is on the street with her kids. I don't do anything uh, when somebody's in pain. I don't ask for prayer. I don't send them a card. I don't cry for them. I don't listen to them. Nothing. But I'm a great faith. Who does it profit? No one. It's not me. I mean, I'm saved. I'm not growing. I'm not maturing. I'm not serving my purpose. So what does it profit? And can your faith save someone naked and hungry? Well, it can if you put it into action. And if you don't, what does it profit? What's the point? Why do you think in the beginning? It tells us that we're blessed in the deed. And it's about perfecting and maturing. Even so, faith, if it have not works, is dead, being alone. Did it say the faith doesn't save? No, I don't remember hearing that. Say it's non-existent faith. No, it didn't even say that. Can't be non-existent. It's clearly existent because it's dead. Dead just means without life, productivity. It's just laying there, doing nothing. Like me some Saturday mornings. <laughs> but it says... What doth it profit, my brethren? Even so, if faith, if it have not works, it's dead being alone. Because this is one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. That's it. You just tell them to go do that. All right, that's good for you. Go in peace. Don't give them anything to eat. Don't put clothes on them. Don't give them things needful for the body. What does it profit? So the whole thing is how is anybody, one, growing, maturing, being perfected that isn't exercising their faith into action? Uh, and two, how are you a benefit to anybody? I mean, the point of us being left here on earth is so others get saved and we're a light to the world. If you're not doing that, what are you doing? Now, it says, thou believest that there is one God. Now, this is something. Uh, that's taken out of context and I never understood why this isn't even saying anything they're trying to make it say, but it says right after it says, yea, a man may say thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. So 
Yeah, wouldn't it be better to show your faith by works than to just say it? That's all he's saying. You won't even need to tell somebody you're a person of faith because they will already know. Okay? Because if you're out there giving mercy and being generous and feeding the poor and loving them and talking to them about Jesus and preaching to God, do you need to tell somebody I'm a person of faith? No. They already know. I don't think there's anybody that's met me for more than five minutes that doesn't know. I love the Lord. I, I don't I don't think there's anyone in my life. I get teased for it constantly. They know. I don't have to go around and say, I'm a woman of a God. I don't have to say nothing. I'll hear it and say, hey, woman of God, how you doing? I hear it all the time because I don't need to say it. And, and that's not saying I'm bragging about being some great Christian. I'm not a fail all the time. But my point is, isn't it, isn't it better to just show people? You know, yeah, that's all he's saying. Yeah, man may say he has faith. And he says, I'll show you my faith without works. And I'll say, I got faith. And I'll show you my faith with works. All he's saying is it's better to do it with works. Okay. So is this about being seen by God and being justified? No. I think it's about being known that you're a person of faith, having your faith mature and grow in the sight of other people. Like Abraham's called a man of great faith to this day because of the works he did. All right. But to God, he was justified, what, 14 years, 14 years before he was even circumcised. All right. So uh, he was say 14 years before he did one thing. Now, let's see. Okay. So here's the one they really twist up. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. That is used all the time as if that verse is saying faith isn't enough to save you. Faith alone, you also need works. Where is that? Do the devils do works? No. Then what are you talking about? And is believing in monotheism how you're saved? No, then why are you using that? What it is saying is, good for you, Israelites. You believe there's one God. He's the one you're going to answer to. Well, that's no great revelation of any import because the devils know it too. And they know there's judgment coming. So it's, oh, it's, we're going to answer for what we do here. Okay? Mere knowledge. Mere knowledge of something does not mean it's productive or that you're serving the Lord, all right? This is about making faith perfect, mature, being blessed in the deed, all right? All right, being of service, making it productive. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Okay, you may think you're righteous, but... It's dead. Your face dead. Not doing anything with it. And I think that's accurate. There's a lot of people that are closet Christians. I'm not going here to beat them up, but we are called to do, we're called on two good works, and I'm all for them. I just don't want people trusting in them. That's why I fight against it. I'm not trying to get people to not do works or to not live godly lives. It's ridiculous. I just don't want people trusting in that to save. All right. And people just put the cart before the horse, you know. All right, now it says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar? To who, though? So wait a minute, Abraham wasn't saved until after Isaac was born and he offered him? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. Let's go to Romans. All right, see, it, it, it's more than just James in the Bible. We, we have to see the whole picture. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, same wording, same wording. If Abraham were justified by works, he have whereof to glory, but not before God. It was not justified before God by his works. If he, if he was, he could, he could boast to God. Nope, nope. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. By the way, James quotes that verse. So I think he understands 
very well imputed righteousness. All right. So I don't believe it doesn't contradict to me. I don't see where it's contradicting. I can see on the superficial level how it could look that way. But once you study it, I don't see how. Um, now it says, now to him that works is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believes, believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's future tense. Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So he was justified in the sight of God. He was, he was already saved before he did anything. The minute he believed God, while he was still uncircumcised, he was justified. Now, did it make his faith perfect and mature to offer Isaac? Yes. And we're told why he did that. Because he believed God so much that a savior would be born. One that would come through Isaac's line that would bless the whole world. And the number would be incalculable. That he knew that even if he sacrificed his son and burned him to ash, that God would raise him up from the ashes to keep his promise. That is why Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But before that, his faith was made perfect when he did this because he knew that not just did he believe God in the beginning when he was given that promise, but he believed him so much that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac, knowing God wouldn't break his word. That's when he became a friend to God. And you'll see that here. All right. I wanted you to see it. Okay. So it's not just one book of the Bible we look at. And I see James using the same language. Let me show you. He does it right here. He said, uh, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See then how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect, mature. There you go. That's the point. All right. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Imputed righteousness means it's not your own righteousness, not based on works, based on the righteousness of God put on your account by faith. So God counted the fact that Abraham believed God's promise that through Isaac, one would come that would bless the nations. And we wouldn't be able to count it. So he knew if God told him to sacrifice Isaac, he raised him from the dead. And so he was willing to do it. Now, of course, God stopped him. It's a shadow of God giving us his son. But here he uses the same language. And it was imputed on him for righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. See, God was Abraham's friend and Abraham believed him, right? But when he offered Isaac, he became a friend to God. And he believed him without any doubt at all. Because he knew even if he killed his own son, God raised him up to keep that promise about the, the promised one coming through the, his line. So you see, this is what he says next. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. This isn't about everlasting life. It's about having faith made perfect, becoming men of great faith, being blessed in the deed, being a witness to all the world with your faith, being profitable to others with your faith, and how, how it pleases God that we take him at his word and believe him. Th this has nothing to do with eternal salvation. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Okay. So all it's saying is 
if Abraham would have just sat there and done nothing, his faith would have been dead. All right, because he mentions uh, Rahab. Wasn't Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and had sent them out another way? She held, She didn't have to help them escape and hang the red cord down, which is a picture of the blood of Jesus, by the way. But she did. You see how she made faith perfect? It wasn't her works. She was a harlot. It wasn't her works. She was not a righteous woman. But God counted her faith for righteousness too. And I believe she was a Gentile. She was a Gentile. She was a convert uh, to the faith. And am I right that she's in the line of Jesus somewhere? Maybe not. I have to, I have to see. Okay. So uh, anyway, you guys, uh, no, uh, I don't have the same position because as you can see, I, I don't think it conflicts. I don't think that James is saying we're justified by works for eternal salvation in the sight of God. I think he's saying uh, maybe justification's a, a harsh word. I do think it's saying in the sight of other people, but uh, I don't need to prove my faith to anybody, but it sure helps because he said, you show me your faith. So who are we showing the faith to? Each other. You know, so faith without works is dead being alone. You're not doing anything with it. But that doesn't say faith is non-existent. Uh, faith didn't save you or any of that. We just, we, that's just twisting God's words, taking it out of context. I think because the same language is used, the law of liberty, uh, Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. I, I think that James is clear on that. I think he's just encouraging them to do what's right. Despite the fact that you're not saved by works, you should be doing something with your faith. It might not save you, but it'll save others. All right, you guys. God bless.